50th year. That's almost as long as I've been alive. That says something about him. It says something about the congregation also. Very positive things. We're excited you're here, brother. I've heard him speak in Memphis uh, several times. And very good speaker. The best part is he delivers truth. And I know he will this evening to open up our Bibles and let's study along. Brother, it's yours. We have two bells. The second one's got to be done. Don't you just love it when they tell you you only got a certain amount of time to speak? But I am truly thankful for the privilege of being here and uh, thankful to each of you for being here. I hope that our study together will be encouraging and profitable and beneficial. Uh, you'll see on the screen behind me a picture of the area of the Mount of the Beatitudes. It was just about a year ago, a little over a year ago, that I led another tour to the Bible Lands and one of my favorite places is to go to that northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and to see the area where the Lord delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And um, i got to make sure that I have to turn anything on. Well, yes, I have to turn it on. Now it's but There we go. The first one was looking up. The second one's looking down. And... Uh, when you look at it, looking down, you can see that it is a natural amphitheater. And what's so unique about that is, if you're sitting up on that mount, you can speak, and people who are sitting down near the waterfront, they can hear every word you're saying. Here in this auditorium, we've got microphones, one in front of me, one tied to me. But if you're standing there, someone as far away as the back can easily hear just as good if they're standing right next to me. But what's also unique is you can take somebody and put them on a boat right on the edge of the water and they can speak from the water and you can hear all the way up the hillside as well. It's just a unique place to be able to deliver a lesson. And if you're standing right there next to the water and you're looking up, that's the mount where the Lord delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And I envy you as you study the Sermon on the Mount this summer in your summer series. You see, as we begin, every preacher has their favorite sermon. I've got mine. I know Jack has his. Every preacher has that favorite sermon. And you deliver that sermon usually in several different places. You may modify it just a little bit because of the people who are in your audience, but you generally will deliver that same lesson more than once. The Lord delivered the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. But if you go to Luke chapter 6 verses 20 through 49, the Lord delivers a very, very similar sermon. And in fact, I think there's great benefit in comparing the two. But I'm not going to do that tonight. I don't have time to do that. But what I'm facing is almost an impossible task. The last time I preached on the Sermon on the Mount and discussed the Beatitudes, I took 11 lessons to cover what I'm going to cover tonight. So you can understand, I'm going to have to do a lot of condensing in order to make this fit. So let's begin, and if uh, things work well, we'll follow it. If they don't, uh, I may just ask the guy to turn the uh, PowerPoint off, but I'll try to do my best here. I want to begin, first of all, with a setting. I think it's important. As you study Matthew chapter 5, my assignment began with verse 3, but I can't skip verse 1. Verses 1 and 2 are so important to be able to appreciate what's found in verses 3 through 12. And after that, we're going to look at the sayings, the eight different blessings which the Lord offers. And the title of the lesson is the basis of blessings. And that is certainly true as we begin this section. Let's begin with verses 1 and 2. And there we read, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now, when you think about that for just a moment, I wish you would think about, first of all, what we read here. Let me see if we can jump here. The crowds, the multitude. And if I could, for just a moment, 
If you want to flip over to Mark's account, I'm going to just briefly tell you, look at the two or three things. You go to Mark chapter 1, and the very end of it, the Lord is having crowds to start gather around Him. And the Lord's facing people from every direction. But when you get to Mark chapter 2, the Lord is in the city of Capernaum, and He is teaching in a house. And there's a group of men came... And they wanted to bring a good friend of theirs who was paralyzed to be healed by the Lord. They couldn't get anywhere near it because the crowds were so many. And what did they do? They went and they took and cut a hole in the roof and let him down because they wanted him to get in the presence of the Lord. And you go to chapter 3. One of the things I find so interesting in chapter 3 is that the Lord now has to ask them to keep him a boat set aside so he could be able to teach. And the reason why the people were crowding so close around him, he couldn't even be able to speak. So he said, keep me a boat, keep it set aside. Now I'm going to go ahead and skip chapters 4 and 5. You come to chapter 6. And when you come to chapter 6, you get about verse 31, and it tells us that they were so busy that they didn't even have time to eat. And the Lord said, come apart and let's rest a while. And you follow that with verses 32 and following. And the Lord is going to get in a boat. He's going to go to the other side. But what's so interesting is the people are so pressing on him that when the Lord gets in that boat to go to the other side, you know what happens? They beat him there. They're running. And then you keep on reading. You get to chapter uh, 7. And then you realize the Lord is now having people so crowding around Him, He's trying to find a place to go. And by the way, I've gone ahead and skipped so much. I skipped the feeding of the 5,000, skipped the feeding of the 4,000. But the Lord ends up going to Tyre. And the text says He went into the house so that they couldn't find Him, and He could not be hidden. Do you understand how pressing the crowds are around Him? But the second thing that you will notice is found in Mark chapter 6 and verse 34. And there it says, And when he came out, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like a sheep not having a shepherd. Now you've got to visualize the Sermon on the Mount realizing that as the Lord looks over the multitudes, he is very concerned and he's very compassionate toward them because he knows they've not had any leadership at all. Which leads me to the next part and that is to the confusion that existed. And I don't know if you realize that all these people like sheep not having a shepherd and so the Lord's had to try to gather them together to be able to teach them. And we read in chapter 7 in verses 28 and 29 and so it was when Jesus had ended the sayings that the people were astonished at His teaching. For He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Do you know what was going on? It's sort of like 2024. What do you believe about baptism? Well, here's my opinion. Well, let me tell you, what do you believe about the Lord's Supper? Well, let me give you my opinion. Everybody was saying, this is my opinion, this is my opinion, this is what I think. Do you know what it really doesn't count is what I think at all? What I think really doesn't matter. What counts is what God has said. And that's what Jesus did in His teaching. He says, have you not read? Or He would say, it is written. He constantly Focus people's minds back to that. And so there was confusion among them. And what that did was the Lord had to then correct all of the false teachings that had been taking place and all the misinterpretations, if you will. In fact, you will notice as you study later in chapter 5, you have heard it said, but I say to you, the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount is now ready to correct. Now, I didn't put it on the screen. This comes extra. Matthew 5 and verse 20. 
I tell you, except that your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you don't have a better faith, a more righteous religion than what you've got, you can't go to heaven. And so all of this is about trying to prepare people to go to heaven. And so the setting now, the Lord's on the mount, His disciples have come to Him, He sits down, and now He's ready to start teaching them. And so He opens His mouth and He teaches. So we're going to begin with the sayings. And the first thing the Lord says, Blessed are... Now, I don't know if you've talked about the word blessed much, but I would tell you that I am a blessed person. I'm blessed because I was born in the United States. I am blessed because I had Christian parents who taught me the truth. I cannot remember the first day I went to church. I grew up in church. I grew up, our house was probably a few hundred yards away from the church building. I wasn't the preacher's son. Uh, my father was a car dealer, but we live real close to the church. Building. My grandfather was an elder, so I know what it is to live next to it. And I consider myself blessed, but I'm also blessed because I have worked with really good brethren. Every congregation that I have been privileged to work with, I have just very much been blessed by good brethren to work with, served under great elders. And for that reason, I consider myself blessed. I'm also blessed because I've had fairly good health in my life, because I've enjoyed a lot of the things that God has had to offer. But now when you get to this word, makarios, it is translated blessed, but do you remember what Jesus said? If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. That's the word, same word that's here, the word happy, and sometimes it's translated. If you look at the lexicon, some of the lexicons will say the word means fortunate. But I'd suggest to you that there's another description that better describes what this word means. And that is God favored. God has done good for you. Do you remember in the Old Testament when Moses had the children of Israel before him and he put before them blessings and what? Curses. If you go to Luke's parallel account, Luke will mention some of these same beatitudes. But do you know what he follows them with? Woes. And I would suggest to you that if you go back to Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, where it appears the Lord has taken this, even though he does not cite this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates both day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away, and the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. When I read those six verses, you know what it tells me? God favors the man who loves him, who walks in his word, who loves his law. And God does not favor the man who chooses to walk in sinful pathways. With that in mind now, I take that back to what we read here, and I begin with the very first of the eight of these, where he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. And there's a question that all of us have to answer. What does that really mean, to be poor in spirit? Well, let me go back. While our world elevates assertiveness, confidence, self-reliance, self-esteem, the Lord here extols humility. The Lord is not looking at us and saying, how confident can you be? The Lord is saying, how humble can you be? 
The best passage that I can think of to illustrate this is found in Philippians chapter 2. This is a wonderful passage that Paul writes to a great congregation in Philippi. And he says to them, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Now think about that for just a second. Lowliness of mind, poor in spirit. Let each esteem others better than himself. Now how do you think that fits in the United States in 2024? We just started the political system that's going to go from now till November. May even much further than that, I don't know. But everybody's telling you how great they are. Everybody's telling you how much smarter than they are than the other person. And everybody is just focused on their promotion of self. And that's the idea of self-ambition. But he says in verse 4, Look, each of you, not only to your own interest, but the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I have to think about that for just a moment. I have to have the mind of Christ in all of this. But he keeps on and he says, Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and being found in the likeness of coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. Jesus is not asking us to do anything that he himself did not do. He humbled himself to be poor in spirit. Now, what he says is the reward. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now you can say, what does that mean? Well, go to Matthew 18. And he says, assuredly I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know before any one of us can enter the kingdom, and that's to enter the church, we have got to have the attitude of humility. The attitude of saying, it's not about me, it's about the Lord. And I'm going to try to illustrate that to you later on a little bit more, but uh, I've got to move on. If I don't, I won't get through. I need to watch my watch here a little bit anyway. Second of all, blessed are those who mourn. Now, um, our world is filled with hedonism, the gratifying of the flesh, the pursuit of pleasure. And the Lord is saying, blessed are those who mourn. And in Luke's account, he said, you know, woe to those who laugh and those who are all about frivolity and, you know, pleasing yourself. Listen to Solomon, if you will. He speaks in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, and really this is a wonderful commentary on this one. In fact, if you write in your Bible, I'd write outside, Blessed are those who mourn. See the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2 and chapter 7. But look with me here at chapter 2. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. I said in my heart, Come now, and I will test you with mirth and enjoy pleasure. Surely this also is vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? If you live your life for pleasure, what are you getting out of it? I can tell you what, you can see people in our world who's lived the life that Solomon describes. And you see, what is it? Well, look, drop down with me now to verses 10 and 11. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not hold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all of my labor. Then I looked at all the works of my hands had done, and the labor that I had toiled, and indeed was vanity grasping for wind. Solomon says, you know what, I look at life, and all that pleasure that I pursued, it didn't mean a thing. It did not mean a thing. Let me tell you something. If you lived to be an old person and you lived all your life for pleasure, you're going to look back and say, didn't mean a thing. Didn't mean a thing. But you see, 
there's value in somber, mournful thinking. Go with me to chapter 7, if you will, and let's look at verses 2 through 4. Better to go into the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For a sad countenance, the heart is made better. And the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the fools is in the house of mirth. You think about people who live their lives never understanding the value of mourning. Mourning over what? Tell you what, I look back and I regret is opportunities that I didn't take advantage of. People who are now in their grave that I didn't speak to. Do you want to stand before somebody on the day of judgment and look them eye to eye and you hear the word said to them, depart from me, you who work iniquity, and I didn't say anything to them? I regret opportunities like it. Mistakes I have made. I don't know how many about you, but I can tell you about me. I can just about recall most of my major mistakes in my mind. And like the Apostle Paul, you rehearse them. You say, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said that. And I learn from that. Because once you learn from it, you don't do those things again. You, you don't keep those things going. Well, what is the Lord's promise here? Comfort. And when you parallel this with Luke's account, this just becomes abundantly clear. Therefore you have sorrow now, or now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And he says that joy nobody can take from you. There are people today who are living it up. They're partying, they're laughing, and all of this. But on the day of judgment, they're going to be the sad ones. And while today I may be saddened by a number of different things, I'm looking forward to the day when I can laugh and smile because I know it's all over. Blessed are the meek. Now, to appreciate this, you have to realize the Lord is again quoting Scripture. Now, he doesn't say it is written in the book of Psalms, but if you go back to Psalms chapter 37 and verse 11, David writes, But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. And I'd suggest to you the latter part of that psalm explains the one that Jesus used here. Now, people sometimes misunderstand the word meekness. Uh, I remember as a kid hearing Jerry Clower talk about playing football. And he said, the guy across from me says, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he said, he took my face and throwed it into the ground. He said, he's stronger than I was. But you see, the word meek does not mean weak. Sometimes, particularly the New King James, uses the word gentle more often. The Greek word praus describes strength under control. In fact, the way the word was used in secular literature was to describe a horse or some sort of beast of burden that's wild. And then you take it and you tame it, and now it's gentle. You know, maybe you've had a horse that had to be broken, and now it's just as gentle and tame. Does it still have all the strength that it always had? Absolutely it does. But what does it do now? That strength has been put under control. Now, our world says, don't let anybody walk over you. You put it right back to them. You let them know you're not going to ex accept what they're giving you. Maybe you're in the job business where you've got somebody over you or you've got customers coming to you and you say, I'm not going to let them get the best of me. I'm going to tell them the way it is. Well, Jesus was the meek and lowly. You remember Matthew 11, verse 29? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. 
the New King James says gentle, meek and lowly, and you shall find rest to your souls. Or if you go to Matthew 21 and verse 5, talking about Jesus as he left Bethphage, or the disciples got the donkey there in Bethphage, they brought it to the Lord, and he rode into Jerusalem. And it says, quoting the book of Zechariah, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, riding on a donkey. Why do you say lowly? Because the Lord was not coming riding on one of these big steeds, you know, the big battle horse. No, that's not what he's riding. He's riding a donkey. He didn't come in to say, look at me, I am the king is going to rule over this earthly kingdom. As he would say to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I would not be delivered to the Jews. Therefore, my kingdom is not from here. And so when we're reading this, we have to realize that the Lord showed us what it means to be lowly. Now, what is the reward? He said, the meek shall inherit the earth. But again, I go back to Psalm 37, verse 11. And he talks about the peace there. You know, when you think about the Lord's church, and you talk about us being His disciples, and you talk about us being led, how many times do you have church problems? And do you know what the source of many problems are? i got to have my way. And if I don't have my way, it ain't going to work. I'm going to let you know I want my way to be done. Folks, I've met way too many of those folks in the church. But the Lord here it says, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle, blessed are those who can keep their strength under control. And those are the people who are going to bring about peace. And now he's going to talk about the peacemakers here in just a little bit. But I think that's important for us to see. And I guess I've lost the, the screen, but that's okay. Uh, while the world hungers for power and prosperity. Godly people are not looking for that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This year, the Memphis School of Preaching, my assignment was this verse. And I spoke for about 40 minutes on this verse. And I'd love to speak about that long to talk about it, but uh, this insatiable desire for God's righteousness. And I have to put it that way. God's righteousness. There's four times in the Sermon on the Mount the Lord mentions righteousness. Here is the first mention of it. The second one are blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. The third time is found in verse 20 of this chapter where he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then the fourth time is chapter 6 and verse 33 where he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And you see Psalm 42, verses 1 through 3. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? My tears have been my food day and night while they continue to say to me, where is your God? He says, just like a deer is thirsty. You know, I didn't used to appreciate that until I started taking a certain medicine, and that medicine makes me thirsty all the time. In fact, several times before I get up to go preach in the mornings at Bobby Branch, I've got a little bottle of water with me, and I have to take a drink of that water or I can't speak. My mouth is just so dry. There have been times when I've just really been thirsty. But he said, just like that deer pants for the water, he says, I am panting for God. In fact, we sing a song that says much like that. But when I think about God's righteousness, the book of Romans defines it so well. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in what? In the gospel is contained the righteousness of God. So what is Jesus saying? Those people 
who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, what will take place? Their reward is they're going to be filled. Psalm 107, verse 9, For He satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul He fills with godly goodness. You know, if you really, really want to know God's will, to do God's will, God is going to satisfy you. And now you can take great satisfaction by taking your Bible every day and reading it. But not just reading it. As David said, you meditate on it day and night. When you're at your job or when you're in the field or, or when you're doing your lawn work, you're thinking, what did he mean by that? How do I apply that in my life? Those people are going, I knew it was an impossible task. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. You know the reason why the world's not very merciful? Because they don't think they need it. I can tell you in Luke chapter 18, Jesus talked about two men. He says, they trusted in themselves, these Pharisees, that they were righteous and despised others. And he talked about their prayer that they offered in if you'll remember, the tax collector standing afar off would not so much even as raise his eyes. What did he do? He said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And when you look at people who do not think they need anything, they can't show mercy to others. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a good illustration. Here's the priest, here's the Levite. They walk by, they don't think they need anything, and so they don't have any concern for somebody else. Mercy comes from those people who genuinely love. In Ephesians 2 and verse 4, But God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which He's loved us. You see, that's the way God acts. He loves us and He is merciful to us. And the reward is we ourselves obtain mercy. You know, I could talk about the parable of the unmerciful servant. You know, the man who owed a huge amount of money and he was forgiven. He took a man who owed him just a small amount. He showed no mercy to him. Well, James chapter 2 and verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. If I am not merciful, then I cannot expect God to be merciful to me on the day of judgment. Blessed are the pure in heart. You see, the world is just stained with impurity. You turn on your television tonight, I don't care if it's broadcast TV or one of the streaming services, you're going to find things that are embarrassing to you. It's softcore pornography now. It used to be hardcore stuff. But the filthy language, etc. Our world is stained with this and you can see it. There's no purity of heart there. And we read from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, he says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And Jesus himself would teach in Luke 6, 45, by the way, which was a part of that Sermon on the Plain. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. An evil man out of the treasure, evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. But the good man who has that pure heart can see God. Psalm 73, verse 1, truly God is good to Israel to such as are of a pure heart. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, we don't know what we're going to look like, but we know that we're going to see Him even as He is. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. You see, the world wants peace, but it wants it on its own terms. The worldly people want you to get along with them. But the way they want you to get along with them is, you come over and do what I want you to do. And I can tell you that I have observed that in the political realm. I've observed it in the business world. And I've observed that in the church too. There's some people who love peace, but they love it on their own terms. But it really requires some effort on our part. Listen to Romans 12 verse 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, Live peaceably with all men. Now, I can't control the way you act, and I can't control what you think, but I can control what I think and the way I act. 
As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Chapter 14, verse 19. Therefore, let us pursue things which make for peace. Have you ever thought about when things become heated and difficult that you pursue the things that work out for peace? Or you go to chapter Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see God. And then James 3, verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Blessed are the peace makers. And he said, those people will see God, and only those who seek peace will find it. Uh, it's interesting. Peter writes in 1 Peter about the conflict that godly people have to face in an ungodly world. And he's talking about all the things that they are going to endure. And he says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile or deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Brethren, that's the second bell. And you know what I'll do for the invitation? I'll take the last of that. So thank you very much.